The gospel reading comes from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going to the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered the village, ten lepers approached him, keeping their distance. They called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. Hallelujah. 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 That was pathetic. Let's try that again. Read that line again, Sarah. They're going to yell this time. Hallelujah. He, uh, he protrasted himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean, but the other nine, where, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That was good, Kathy. Do that at every. Thanks be to God. Let me hear some. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Gotta learn how to yell, folks. We gotta get this congregation louder. I told this story before, but it is so appropriate. My husband, when he our first date was when he came to church to hear me preach, which is weird. But he was Baptist, and he came to the Hedgesville United Methodist Church, which is also in West Virginia. He was from Southern West Virginia, this is in the Eastern Panhandle. I was preaching, he said, Amen, and the whole congregation went, Oh! <gasps> Asked me later, he said, Are you sure they're not Quakers? No, they're not Quakers, they're just very quiet Methodists. So we got to learn to be more shouting like Baptists here. Okay. Jesus is going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. It wasn't like there was a place that was between these two lands, there was a border. We know what borders are like, right? borders where you line up and shoot at each other across the border, right? Hatfields and McCoys, that kind of border, or the Samaritans. And whenever you hear Samaritan scripture, what would Jews do when they heard that word? They'd cringe. They'd make faces. They'd just, they'd just about spit. There was such enmity between these people. It had been going on for centuries and centuries and centuries since the Assyrian exile. We talked recently about Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar and the southern kingdom, Judah, the exile there where they were carried off and Jerusalem was ransacked and the temple was destroyed. Well, the northern kingdom of Israel was where the Assyrians had carried people off and they were taken out of their land, but the people who remained behind were Samaritans who were Jews back centuries before, but they intermarried and things happened through the years and I always say, if you speak Harry Potter, they were mudbloods. Some of you understand what that means, right? They're people of mixed lineage, and the Jews hated them because they said that the true temple was on Mount Gerizim, which had by this time been destroyed like the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed, had been rebuilt by the time of Jesus. But they hated Samaritans. You cannot understand how much they hated Samaritans. Luke's gospel is full of stories about Samaritans. The good Samaritan only appears in... Luke's Gospel, and we say the Good Samaritan, like, you know, that was an odd thing for them. We cannot understand the level of vitriol between these two people. They would not eat together. They would not speak with each other. But strange things happen sometimes, right? And if you're a leper, what is leprosy now? Does anybody know the name of leprosy today, the real name of the disease that is, was called leprosy? It's called Hansen's disease. It's a flesh-eating bacteria, but it can be cured now, but highly contagious. And in those days, they were not sure. If you had any sort of outbreak on your skin, it could just be you were a teenager having a little acne flare-up, you were considered unclean because you could have something that could be contagious that could really end up making you sick. How many of you felt like ringing a bell saying unclean if you had COVID in the last year or two? Or if someone coughed and you were in the grocery store, everybody was like, oh! Don't cough near me, don't, don't sneeze. Everybody's so afraid of everybody else. Well, this was truly unclean in a spiritual sense because I could read you the passage, but it would take the rest of the service. 
what you had to do if you had some sort of thing that was considered leprosy. You had to go to the priest and show yourself, not just once, but several times. You had to bring a libation offering, a drink offering. You had to bring a grain offering. You had to bring a, an animal offering. You had to make a sacrifice again and again and again until you were finally judged clean. Not healthy by a doctor, but clean by the priest. So can you imagine what the life of people with leprosy in those days was? It was being ostracized, it was being segregated, it was being pushed to the side, and you couldn't be with your family. You couldn't be in a house with anyone that you knew or loved. You couldn't even go to the temple to worship. You were so cut off from society. That's what the life was for a leper in the first century when Jesus lived. And here they are in this no man's land. So if you speak Star Trek as opposed to Harry Potter, we're talking the no man's land between the Romulans and the, you know, that, the Federation, that, no, nobody here speaks that language, okay. But here they are in this place that nobody wants to be because nobody likes each other, so they're staying as far away from the border as they can from each other. And the lepers are there, and they're mixed together, Jews and Samaritans, because nobody wanted anybody around them at that point because they were so unclean. No wonder Jesus, they see him, they've heard about him. Even in their isolation, they've heard stories of this man who can heal anybody. And they cry out to him. What do they cry out? Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he sees them, he says to them, go show yourselves to the priests. Now, we don't know how mixed this group was. There might have just been one Samaritan. We don't know. We sort of assume that there was one Samaritan and the others were all Jews. But they are so excited as they run off. They do what he says. But... He sort of chastises them, doesn't he? Because only one comes back to give him thanks. That one comes back shouting. Let me hear you shout your praise to God here again. Shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. That's the last time you do that spontaneously. Think about that one for a moment. Only one comes back to thank him. And Jesus says the words that are like a knife into the heart of his disciples and those listening... Didn't only, weren't there others who were healed, but only one comes back. And wasn't he the foreigner? That awful person that everyone hated was the one who gave him thanks. And Jesus then says to him, go, your faith has made you well. Your faith has healed you. Literally, in Greek, the translation is your faith has saved you. Saved you. Your faith has saved you. We believe in salvation by faith, don't we? By grace through faith. So what does this have to do with Paul's letter to Timothy? This is the last writing that Paul has. Now, there's debate among biblical scholars whether Paul actually wrote this or someone writing as Paul, which was legal to do. It wasn't like a forgery. Someone who was part of Paul's following may have written this because it seems to be written very long after Paul died. But it is written before Paul dies at the end of his life, and he talks about being chained, being chained. Now, he was a prisoner, certainly, but not literally chained to a wall. But he had no freedom. And how did Paul die? Do you all know how Paul died? We're not sure, but he was executed. They think maybe he was beheaded. This is before that happens, and we're going to get to that part next week. I don't think we're going to read it next week, though, where he says... I have run the good race. I've, I've kept my eyes on the prize, sort of. I've done what I've been asked. I've been poured out, and here I am. He's at the end of his life. And what does he say to Timothy, the young pastor, that he is nurturing and, and mentoring along the way? He tells him about being chained like a criminal, but he says the word of God is not chained. And what is the word of God but Jesus Christ? So he says, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead. That is my gospel. It's not like there's the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you proclaim the good news, you're proclaiming Christ. When you're giving someone good news and hope, you're giving them Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do in the world, isn't it? To give other people Jesus Christ. I mentor a kid named Sam. He's not a kid. He's 30 years old almost. He'll be 30 in November. But I've mentored him for years. He was my intern when he was 22 years old. And every time I say goodbye to him on the phone, he says, I love you. And he says, give him heaven. Give him heaven. Not give him hell. Give him heaven. Give them heaven. Give them Jesus Christ, is what we're saying to each other in that moment. So what are the things that chain us in the world? We're not chained to a wall somewhere, are we? We're not, we're not held as hostages or captives, but what are the things that chain us up in the world? I want to ask you, call them out. What chains you? What gets you bound up and 
holds you captive? Fear. Fear. Amen. What else? Frustration. Frustration. I'm the poster child for stress these days. Anybody else have a little problem with stress and worry and all those things? What else gets you bound up and held captive tightly? Just sin, right? Addictions. Judgment. Grief. They hold us captive, don't they, sometimes? We feel like we cannot break loose, but what does he say about God cannot be chained? The word of God cannot be chained. Jesus Christ cannot be changed. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is sure, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. No matter how far or short we fall, Christ will be with us because he will be faithful. He cannot go back on his word, his promise, the covenant offered in his name, he offered us once and for all. So Paul, at the end of his life, can praise his God and Savior. Remind them of this, he says. Remind them of this. Some of you are my Facebook friends, right? If you saw my post this morning, I put a new whatever the thing at the top is. Not your cover photo, I guess it's called. It's one that I made a few years ago because today is the anniversary of my husband's death. He died on a Sunday six years ago. I put something that he said, not when he was dying, but when he was diagnosed with the disease that killed him. He said to me, that day, shaming my own faith, he said to me, I've had a really good life. If I get more, I will be grateful. If this is all there is, I will not stop being grateful. I will not stop being grateful. That's some faith there. I know I went back today and I posted, you know when you post a memory, it comes up with all the comments that you had before? I looked at all the comments from people who have died since then. We said, amen, that's what I believe. One being Judy Harrison Johnson, who was a member of the youth group I had when I was in seminary at Glenelg United Methodist Church, where her father was the pastor, and she died several years ago of cancer with teenagers at home. And one of the people who commented was Iris Hull, who died just a few months ago at 96 years old. If we live with him, if we endure with him, we will reign with him. This is the promise that carries us through life. So salvation, if salvation is a gift of Jesus Christ, if salvation is having the word of God given to us in Jesus Christ, part of that must be recognition, and that is the, what the story of the lepers and the one who went back and said thank you was, to recognize that Christ is the source of all that we have, all that we ever hope to be, and Christ needs to be thanked every day of our lives. And I mean it. I thank God for you all every day. And I made a little joke before, but it's not a little joke. If somebody just really is kind of snippy or something with me, I picture that person. I say, thank you, God, for this person. I keep saying thank you until I'm really, really grateful for that person in my life because of what you teach me, what you show me of your faith. Because even the people who tweak your nerves are worthy of thanks and praise to God. I thank God every day for my husband. Still, he's been gone six years today, and I still thank God for him every day because if I would stopped thanking God for my husband, if I stopped thanking God for all of you, if I stopped thanking God for every moment I've had in my life, I will stop remembering what a gift you all are to me. You're a gift to me. I call. I say thank you, God, for my call to ministry. Thank you, God, for my ordination. I say thank you, God, for my crazy dog every day of my life. Because my dog shows me unconditional love, and I need some unconditional love in my life. We've got to learn to shout out to God, because we're so quiet about it. Who is going to know what God has done for you if you don't tell them? Who will know? Who will know the gospel of Jesus Christ unless you make it real for them? Who is going to know who Christ is if you keep him chained up inside your heart? We are not safe for our own sake. It's not like, ooh, I'm in, you're out. Well, I'm, I'm good. Bye. We treat salvation as if it's a momentary thing. Salvation is not the end of the story. It's the beginning of a new life with Jesus Christ that overflows to everyone you meet. 
So I hope you'll start sharing Christ with each other. I told this to the people at the first service. This morning I want to say it to you. If you're married, raise your hand. Got to make sure you know who's married here and who's not. I want you to go home and do something you may have not done in a while. I want you to look at your spouse and say, I thank God for you. I thank God for you. Madeline's looking at her husband. She's been married a whole five years to him. You had your anniversary just Friday, didn't you? Happy anniversary to you. That's a joy. I want you to say thank you to God for each other. Because if you do that, you'll remember that that person is God's gift to you and your gift to each other. Because sometimes brides will say to me, who's going to give me away? And I say to them, who owns you? Because the United Methodist Liturgy since the 70s has said, as they give themselves to one another in covenant with the giving and joining of hands and the giving and receiving of rings. You're not giving away. You give yourself to each other, and that's a gift. Now, if you're like me and you've lost your spouse, and we have people here who have lost their spouses, thank God for the spouse that you had. Thank God for the people in your life right now. Thank God for those who remind you every day that you are loved and you are cherished and you are a wonder in God's name. <coughs> Don't be chained up by your own doubt or your own fear or your own worry that somebody might think you're a holy roller. If you talk about Jesus, oh no, I can't talk about Jesus. Politics and religion are off. Nah, talk about politics, talk about religion. Talk to each other. Don't fight, talk to each other about what you believe, why you come to believe it, and talk to each other about Jesus Christ. Because if you talk to each other about Christ, then you'll be able to talk to somebody who does not know Christ. It's practice. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead to descendant of David. That is my gospel for which I suffer hardship, even being chained like a criminal, but the word of God is not chained. We're going to sing a song now that talks about not being chained. It's the words of amazing grace with a lovely refrain. We've sung it before. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Grace is amazing, and it's yours, but you've got to share it. Amen? Amen. Can you say amen a little louder? Amen. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Can you say thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's sing. Amen.